Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansi. Tonight, horrific conditions inside a long-term care facility in Montreal. The conditions were disgusting. How COVID-19 is striking vulnerable people across Canada. If you want to go to a fishing cabin, this is not the time. Urgent calls for physical distancing on a long weekend built around social gatherings. It feels like exploitation. Why deferring mortgage payments is a case of save now, pay more later. And how the rapid onset of the virus caught so many by surprise. We didn't stockpile sufficient equipment. We weren't ready. We're looking at the week when it all changed in Canada. This is The National. Millions of Canadians are spending this holiday weekend in isolation as the numbers rise from the COVID-19 pandemic. Globally, more than 100,000 people have died, the number of confirmed infections steadily climbing towards 2 million. Tonight, we'll hear about Canada's early response to the outbreak, the latest calls for better testing, and look at the crumbling situation in some long-term care facilities where hundreds of people have already died. And that's where we begin, at a privately run facility in the Montreal suburb of Dorval. What has emerged is a picture so grim the home was more like a house of horrors. Sarah Levitt has our story. A site that has become all too common. But here at Residence Heron, nurses describe a situation that was out of control. We went uh, room to room and uh, what we found was uh, inhumane. Horrific. The conditions were disgusting. Sent in to reinforce a dwindling staff, Laura Donna Mule says she was appalled by what she saw. The patients uh, were drenched in urine and feces, and I could tell that you know it was there for a long time because their sheets were brown and black, uh, right up to their neck. Another person inside says patients were dehydrated, their basic needs unmet, staff almost nowhere to be seen. The entire residence is a hot zone. Judy Whelan went to Heron this week to see her mother and tell her her husband, Judy's father, had died at another long-term care facility. While her mother is lucid, many at Heron live with dementia and Alzheimer's. My concern is a lot more for those patients that can't advocate for themselves. They can't tell their family that they're not being fed or they're not getting out of bed. The local health authority has taken over management of the privately run facility. The government says only two deaths were due to COVID-19. But those inside Heron worry that number is surely higher and may include a death this morning. The government is launching an investigation into the facility and its management. I do trust that the uh, Sius has taken charge and is taking care of uh, the people inside the residence. I want to reassure the families. The nurses inside the facility say it seems things have improved. There are more staff and the residents are cleaned up and fed. Now the question is, how could it have gotten as bad as it did? Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. There's a worsening situation at another kind of facility near Toronto. As COVID-19 sweeps through, much of the staff has left. And that's putting residents in a tough spot. David Common has the details. Yet another facility with the ingredients for a disaster. One in four of the residents here has tested positive. Others show symptoms. Already the home was short staffed, but with this news, it's suddenly become even shorter. His sister is in there. She's 53 years old. And we read early this morning that um, staff had worked out, walked out last evening, so we're quite concerned. Participation House, as seen in this video from Better Times, is a home for people with disabilities. They share common areas and bathrooms. But yesterday, after the confirmed positives, many workers left. They told staff anybody felt that they were at risk of exposure, uh, that they could self-quarantine. And many of our members took that uh, as permission to, to leave the, the workplace. It all prompted a panic call for assistance. Anyone who could help should come immediately and bring help. Also, they needed personal protective equipment, which was in dangerously low supply. 
The community, including this MP, heard the calls, dropped off things like gowns, which the home had nearly exhausted. We'll make sure we get proper staff uh, in there supporting the, the residents. The provincial government dispatched its own staff to fill an emergency need. It all underscores the higher risks in densely populated care homes with pre-existing staff shortages, exacerbated now by workers who are either infected or fear they've been exposed. For Louise and Earl, another fear that they just don't know. I just don't feel that Ontario is doing enough about testing. Everything I read, everything I see, there's just not enough testing, especially in these types of facilities. Yeah. Participation House now in lockdown, struggling to keep the virus from spreading further. David Common, CBC News, Markham, Ontario. We're going to look closely at how Ontario is doing its testing in a moment, but first, the situation across the country tonight. 621 people have died as the confirmed case count passes 22,000. Alberta recorded seven deaths today, the highest one day tally yet. In Quebec, 765 new cases and 25 deaths. In Ontario, almost 500 new cases and 10 deaths, and that brings us to the province's struggle to ramp up testing. Ellen Morrow looks at how it's trying to catch up. It all started with um, a lot of headache and a lot of fatigue, then um, a runny nose and a horrible cough. Aliona Besanoff has been sick in bed for weeks. One of many Ontarians refused a test for COVID-19. There's so much dependent on that test, and unfortunately, you don't get any answers, right? Ontario has Canada's lowest rate of testing per capita. To try to fix that, the province now plans to proactively test high-risk and vulnerable groups, including healthcare workers and people in shelters. The sooner we can identify cases, the sooner we can act, contain cases and stop the spread. Testing is also being expanded at long-term care homes. Right, the, the province now says all symptomatic residents should be tested, along with asymptomatic residents who may have come into contact with someone who is sick. Local it's not enough, says country. this epidemiologist, who argues testing should include all care home residents. We know this is a wildfire that's raging in chronic care institutions. We need to put it out, and we can't put it out if we can't see it. At first, Ontario struggled with a backlog. Now it's not even meeting its capacity. Alberta and Quebec are testing at more than twice the rate of Ontario based on population. What we really need is we need a snapshot of where we are now. The testing has been such a mess for so long that we really are relying on lagging indicators to tell us where we are in this outbreak. While the new plan is to test up to 16,000 people a day by early May, it likely won't help Aliona Besanoff, who isn't in a priority group. If you do know it's COVID, I guess you know it and you, you deal with it. If you know it's not, then you get this huge relief. Like so many, she may never know either way. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Toronto. Frontline healthcare workers have seen so much and they're starting to speak out like family physician and anesthesiologist, Dr. Nadia Alma. She posted this picture of herself after one of her COVID-19 patients refused life support. Earlier today, our chief political correspondent, Rosemary Barton, asked her about that and about her message to Canadians. Here she is for the record. He turned to me and said, if I go, if I die from this, I, I would rather die looking at the sky. I would rather die talking to my family. And so I sat with him and we looked at the sky and it was a beautiful sunny, it was a beautiful sunny day. And we talked about his family and he put his family on the phone so that I could talk to them too. How, how are you doing? How, how, how worried are you about your own health and your kids? I love being a doctor, but I'm scared. I'm scared because I'm afraid of catching the disease. I'm afraid of passing it on to my more vulnerable patients. And I'm afraid of being one of the statistics that passes away from it. A couple of days ago, my six-year-old turned to me and hugged me and said, please don't die. I just sat there holding him until he stopped being afraid for a little while. You know, we're, we're being told we, we've, we're in the beginning of this. We, we've got to buckle down for many, many more weeks. Um, what, what would you tell Canadians? It's worth it. It is helping. Please stay safe and keep faith. 
keeping the faith and staying safe. Two prominent themes as we begin this Easter long weekend. In a moment, we'll look at how some are worshiping in a COVID-19 world. But first, why some are taking risks by taking a weekend getaway. Here's Tina Lovegreen. Ready to escape to the outdoors, vacationers stream onto the ferry headed to BC's southern Gulf Islands. Just getting out of the city for the weekends. I've been uh, cooped up in my Yaletown apartment for like a month. Kate Marshall's mother lives on Galliano Island. Her business is struggling because of COVID-19. So Marshall's going to cheer her up. Other than this interaction, um, I'm, I'm not planning to have a lot of interactions with other people as well. Many others in the lineup, at least the ones that would talk to us, say the same thing. We got a property there, two acres isolated from everybody. So we probably won't see another person the whole weekend we're there. But even then, officials have been begging people not to travel. Whether you want to go to Seashelt for a trip, this is not the time. If you want to go to a fishing cabin, this is not the time. The unwelcome visitors. Frustrating locals desperate to keep their communities safe. It's very frustrating. You sit here in a 15 minute period, you can see dozens and dozens of vehicles going through here that are clearly not locals. Galliano Island resident Jane Wolverton took this video last night, showing the stream of cars rolling onto the island. We have a very limited medical response here. We have a half time doctor and one nurse practitioner. We have no ventilators. In the small tourist town of Tofino, police checkpoints, asking people why they're coming in. A small handful of them were second homeowners, and even one car turned around and, and went home, so that was good news. Turning people away, not something places that heavily rely on visitors are used to doing. But for now, they're asking people to stay away. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Delta, BC. BC's provincial health officer says that she trusts people to do the right thing, but other cities and provinces are making it clear there could be harsh consequences for those not keeping their distance. And I think it is time, given the importance of this, that it's a life or death matter that people should uh, be given tickets. Toronto's mayor says officers will patrol parks all weekend. Fines of up to $5,000 could be imposed. And that you'd better change the way you've been behaving and you better do it now, or you're going to be lighter in the pocketbook very, very soon. And a stern warning in Manitoba. Individuals face fines of nearly $500, business more than $2,500. Even at the best of times, holidays can intensify feelings of loneliness. But these days demand new ways of celebrating and trying to stay connected. Chris Brown has that story. On a day deeply steeped in tradition, experimentation and innovation were instead the themes. In an empty St. Peter's Basilica, just the Pope kissed the crucifix at the end of the Good Friday ceremony rather than all of the clergy. And in Jerusalem, only a few rather than a procession followed the presumed path Jesus walked before his crucifixion. But crowds weren't forbidden everywhere. In Dusseldorf, Germany, hundreds worshipped in their cars. And just like an old drive-in movie, they listened to their priest on their radios. We made the effort to come up with a workaround, said the local Catholic dean. Blessings to each and every one of you. Closer to home, Archbishop Paul André du Rocher posted his Good Friday wishes on YouTube. Perhaps technology can forge deeper connections with parishioners, he hoped. This time of creativity for the church, I think, can truly be a time of renewal. Yet other church leaders wrestled with the loss of human contact and important rituals. Right now they're all forbidden and we're all kept away. And that's, that's taking us out of touch with our humanity. Let my people go. Perhaps, but there were also clearly some creative solutions for big family get-togethers and dinners that couldn't happen. We want to welcome each and every one of you tonight to the virtual Seder. Which the Passover Seder feast played out via video conference in households around the world. And it wasn't just video that united people. In Cuenca, Spain, a country reeling from an awful death toll, it was sound of drums played from balconies instead of in the streets. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver.
As the pandemic heads towards a peak in Canada, there are questions about how experts inform the government and government's early handling of the crisis. Public parliamentary documents help fill in those gaps. Salima Shibji explains. These are tough times. A reminder repeated today that we're in this for the long haul. Even though internal documents show the advice from health officials to government was much less urgent a month ago. We're going to continue to act in ways uh, recommended by the top experts, by the top me medical professionals. They were saying as late as March 10th that the threat of the virus spreading in Canada was low. Right now, the risk is low because we don't have incredible community transmission. A day later... Pandemic is not a word to use lightly. The WHO started calling the outbreak a pandemic. A day after that, the Prime Minister's wife confirmed sick. And as his briefings became a daily break from self-isolation, many wondered if Canada's response was too slow. We moved very quickly and early, earlier than uh, some countries, on uh, countering uh, the potential spread of the virus. Uh, at those days, the numbers of Canadians infected were still low. The documents also reveal by early February, health officials already knew the global market for masks was tightening fast. Canada was only able to scoop up a modest amount. Doctors and nurses now are anxiously rationing what they have. We didn't stockpile sufficient equipment. Um, we weren't ready, and hence the incredible effort that's being made right now. But for public health officials, this completely new virus caught the whole world off guard. We're learning, we're humbled by this virus, and we're learning as uh, every single day. A notion echoed by the Prime Minister. As we look back, of course, there's going to be things we said, oh, we might have said this differently or that differently. There's going to be an awful lot of learning through this. More learning and a promise to keep shifting the response as the crisis drags on. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. A rare Saturday sitting of Parliament will debate the government's wage subsidy program. The pandemic has certainly caused real financial crises from households across the country to global industries. In a moment, we'll look into complaints about Canadian banks and their offers of mortgage deferral. But first, the efforts to keep big oil from tanking. Last night, the OPEC countries and Russia tentatively agreed to an unprecedented cut in production just weeks after flooding the market in a price war. Lower production and higher prices should help Canada's industry, but it isn't so simple. Carolyn Dunn has reaction from Alberta. Since he got laid off from his oil and gas construction job a couple of weeks ago, Wayne Lodge fills his time with home construction projects. It's waking up every day and, and checking the news, checking the price of oil. It's keeping an eye on world stage and yeah, yeah, definitely hanging on. But it's far from certain whether yesterday's deal to cut production by 10 million barrels a day would be enough. It's got to be closer to 20 or 25 million barrels over the next few months to come off to balance us back to where we were pre-COVID. Today, energy ministers from the G20 struck a pact of solidarity towards achieving a stable oil price. Though Canada's natural resources minister told CBC News there are no firm details about how that will work. No, I think the position right now is, you know, aiming at price stability. I mean, what do we need to do to talk to our to our partners in order to make sure that we achieve that for for the good of our economy and for and for our workers and for their families? Many companies in Canada's energy sector are running out of time as their values plummet. Alberta's our premier warning just how costs. severe this our oil glut is. is. That every uh, square inch of storage in North America will be at tank tops. At, in four to six weeks based on current trends. And I don't need to tell you how catastrophic that would be uh, for our industry should that occur. No quick way back from a shock to the industry like this one. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. For many Canadians, the mortgage is their biggest monthly payment. And the country's major banks have responded by allowing customers to defer payments for up to six months. But there is a catch and it's got some customers outraged. Erica Johnson explains. More than 600,000 Canadians have asked for a mortgage deferral or to skip a payment during these financially trying times, including Amanda Merle and her husband. It gave me some hope. 
But when she went on CIBC's website to apply, she learned her bank would still be charging interest during the deferral period and then adding that interest to the outstanding principal and charging more interest. In a time when we're already sort of down, it seems it feels like exploitation. For her, a four-month deferral translates to an extra $7,400 in interest, erasing almost half the money put towards the principal last year. It feels like you're taking a vulnerable population that are saying, hey, we need help, and you're extending the help, but it's with all these, with this sort of gotcha. It's not just CIBC. All the big banks have similar programs. So they're not giving me a break or anything. Basically, it's just the bank profiting off of this emergency. Financial institutions need to do more, says a banking critic, like temporarily scrapping all mortgage payments for people in need. People's loan payments should just be stopped now. And the banks could afford to do it, and the federal government should require them to do it. The Prime Minister says the banks have taken significant steps to help, but he too is calling for more. Both CIBC and RBC told CBC News that customers are benefiting from their programs. A spokesperson for the Canadian Bankers Association says the banks have already forgiven almost $800 million in mortgage payments, leaving more money in the pockets of people who need it. He didn't address customer concerns about all that extra interest. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. In British Columbia, officials continue to deal with the worst COVID-19 outbreak in a Canadian prison. At Medium Security Mission Institution in B.C.'s Fraser Valley, at least 24 inmates and three guards have tested positive. The prison has been locked down as officials wait for the results from 18 other tests. Some welcome news for parents with children in Ontario daycares. The province says it's banning those facilities from charging parents fees during this crisis. This has created some strain on a lot of parents in the province, working people who are, have automatic withdrawals of hundreds or thousands of dollars per month. An emergency order ensures parents will not lose their childcare space because they're not paying fees. The province also says they're still on track to have schools reopen in May. And an additional five employees have tested positive for COVID-19 at Halifax's Northwood Seniors Residence, bringing the total to nine. Five residents of the complex have also contracted the virus. The next story isn't about the pandemic. It's about a teen girl shot dead by Winnipeg police after a robbery and high-speed chase. Cameron McIntosh has reaction from the force and the girl's father. A high-speed chase, a 16-year-old girl dead in south suburban Winnipeg. In this video, you hear police shooting. What's not clear is the altercation that caused the deadly response killing 16-year-old Aisha Hudson. Her father says it was unnecessary. Basically, with the, the recording, it looked like it was all wrong. Like, you don't shoot when you have a vehicle already stopped. Police say the girl and four other teens robbed this liquor store, then using a stolen car, rammed a police car, then a chase ensued. The car, driven by the girl, hit several others before stopping a few kilometers away. It is during this encounter that one of our officers discharged their firearm. Winnipeg's police chief didn't say specifically why the shots were fired. Deadly use of force is appropriate when an officer fears for their own life or the life and safety of others. That's a real general answer. It comes after months of thefts, many by minors in Manitoba's provincial liquor stores. Workers are told not to intervene for safety reasons, making alcohol an easy target. Earlier this year, one worker was violently assaulted. This is totally, totally unacceptable. The Premier warned it would no longer be tolerated. Stores have been installing secure entrances. This store didn't have one yet. All along, there have been fears a robbery would lead to a death. As for the girl, she had a troubled past. Still, her father is surprised she was involved. He wants to know what happened here. Why would they go so far to what they did to shoot when they already had been stopped? Manitoba's Police Oversight Agency is investigating. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Some good news in the fight against COVID-19 leads to a debate in the United States. I don't know that I've had a bigger decision than that when you think, right? Up next, the infection rate is slowing down south of the border. When is it time to reopen the country? An inside look at Canadian preparations. Planning to put inpatient beds where there never 
have been beds before. Our doctor's diary takes us inside a Toronto hospital. Hello, daddy. And reunited after quarantine, Hello, what this dad did to keep his family safe. We're back in two. The coronavirus continues to exact its deadly toll in the U.S., especially in New York. More than 18,000 people have died of COVID-19 in the United States, and there are nearly half a million infections. But for a glimmer of hope, experts are pointing to a different number, reflecting where the virus is today rather than days ago. Katie Simpson on why it has health officials changing their outlook. Badly needed help to expand testing in the U.S. is starting to arrive. Half a million swab kits flown in from Italy are being sent to medical facilities all over the country. Some good news among other glimmers of hope. We are cautiously optimistic that we are slowing the infection rate. In New York, the number of ICU patients dropped for the first time. Hospitalizations are flattening out, even though the state itself has more cases than any country outside of the U.S. In Chicago, another hot zone, numbers are dropping there too. What we're starting to see is a flattening, and we may not actually get the kind of apex or peak that we've been thinking about. The president says physical distancing is working, so much so nationwide projection Thanks models so have shifted. Everybody. Instead of 1,000 deaths as the best case scenario, it's now closer to 60,000. In the midst of grief and pain, we're seeing clear signs that our aggressive strategy is saving countless lives. But the coronavirus task force warns this does not mean restrictions can be eased. We have not reached the peak. And so every day we need to continue to do what we did yesterday and the week before. Donald Trump acknowledged reopening the country too quickly could lead to more deaths and it's weighing Speaking on his this. mind. I don't know that I've had a big decision. The revised projections don't change what's happening in hard hit areas. A new military field hospital is now taking coronavirus patients in Detroit. Hundreds of people lined up in their cars in Miami at a drive through food bank. And there are new tracking measures in Wisconsin to see if any infections are linked to exposure from Wednesday's election. To help with his biggest decision, the president will unveil a new task force next week, which will focus on how to reopen the country. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. More than four years ago, Wanda Dench accidentally invited a complete stranger to her family's Thanksgiving dinner. Now that stranger is looking for ways to return the favor under the most difficult circumstances. It's a mistake that led to an unlikely friendship. Wanda Dench and her husband Lonnie met Jamal Hinton back in 2016 after Wanda accidentally texted him instead of her grandson. Their story got lots of attention when Jamal and his girlfriend actually showed up for dinner. It was the start of a new Thanksgiving tradition. But earlier this week, Lonnie passed away from complications related to COVID-19. And with Wanda forced to mourn in self-isolation, Jamal is now offering up his gratitude the same way they did that first Thanksgiving. Oh, guys, I love you guys. We love you too. Next on The National, our regular segment putting your questions to our experts, including this one. In order to perform an essential service like repairing a furnace or a plumbing leak, is it okay to enter a stranger's home if they agree to not be there? But first, the latest in our COVID-19 how-to guide. Here's Andrew. Indoors or outdoors? Where are you safer from this coronavirus? Well, it's a bit of a trick question. It's a bit like asking whether a meal tastes better in your kitchen or in your backyard. It sort of misses the point. If we talk about uh, droplet particles, usually those don't float around in the air. They sort of land uh, within a, a foot or two from, uh, from where they're released from somebody. Translation, infected droplets typically fly out and then they land, whether you're inside or outside. So by far, the more important question you ought to be asking yourself is whether there are other people around. Now, of course, we may see new evidence of potential airborne transmission, particularly in confined spaces. And so the advice could change. And, and yeah, outside there is wind to dry the virus out and more space to spread it. So, you know, maybe technically it might be slightly safer outside, but I think it, it might actually just not be that relevant.
Welcome back. It's time in the program to put your COVID-19 questions to our doctors. And joining us tonight, infectious disease specialist, Dr. Isaac Bogosh in Toronto. And in Ottawa, emergency room physician, Dr. Melissa Ewan Innes. Dr. Bogosh, first question to you. Uh, if I am a COVID-19 survivor, should I consider donating my blood towards a future cure for this virus? I mean, this is a fantastic question, and certainly we're starting to hear about uh, trials that are looking at uh, what's called convalescent uh, plasma. Uh, that's people who have recovered, have formed antibodies against this virus, and now they're using the plasma from the survivors to help treat people and to see if this uh, is, can, is, can, can be helpful in the recovery. There's clinical trials that are going to be starting across Canada, so people may actually be contacted for a, for a blood donation to see if they can help with this, uh, with this program. Uh, as of yet, there's no formal program set up, but stay tuned. This might be in the, in the days or weeks ahead. All sounds very hopeful. Dr. Ewan Innes, next question to you. In order to perform an essential service like repairing a furnace or a plumbing leak, is it okay to enter a stranger's home if they agree to not be there? So the fact that they're not there is a bonus because you know that they won't be coughing and sneezing on you. You should do your normal precautions like wash your hands for 20 seconds, wear gloves. But I did see at least one plumber's group that suggested you should wear safety glasses and a face shield because I think what they're worried about is that we have found viral RNA in feces, which is poo. So we want to make sure that plumbers and other essential service workers aren't exposed additionally. So glove up, wash up, and thank you very much for performing your essential service. No kidding. All right. Uh, Dr. Bogosh, next question to you. And this is a version of a question we've heard a few times before, but this time it's how long can the virus stay on fabric like bedding? That's a very common question because, uh, you know, we, we, come, we may come into contact with contaminated surfaces. The virus can likely live on different surfaces for about two hours to two days. And some of the data emerging that uh, showed it on, uh, on fabrics, uh, it was closer to the 24 to 48 hour uh, mark. So certainly there's other factors like temperature and humidity that will uh, uh, enable this virus to live for a longer or shorter period of time, but it, it can live for up to a couple of days. So if we're concerned about a contaminated fabric, it should be washed in the, uh, in the washing machine with uh, soap and detergent. One last question to both of you, Dr. Bogash, to you first. We each have maybe about 20 seconds uh, for you to answer this. Uh, can I still go for runs if I make sure to social distance? Absolutely, yes. Uh, of course, we have to abide by the uh, public health measures of the city and the province and the country, but many of these suggest that it's completely okay to go outside for some exercise as long as you're physically distant from others. And Dr. Ewan Innes? So we think that the benefits outweigh the risks. You can always run by yourself, um, not if you're COVID positive. Uh, we don't. We would like you to self-isolate. And the other thing you might consider is if you would wear a cloth mask to try and keep your droplets inside rather than contaminating other people that would be a thoughtful thing to do okay almost not fair of me to ask you that question I'll only give you 15 or 20 seconds but you both did a great job thank you very much for speaking to us tonight thanks for having us thank you and if you're a regular viewer you know we'll be asking your questions about COVID-19 every night so you can send them to us message us directly on Instagram at CBC the national or send us an email at COVID at cbc.ca just put the national in the subject line. The spring weather adds some new complications to beating the coronavirus. As temperatures rise across Canada, so does the risk of some natural disasters. Flood season is already underway in parts of Quebec, and residents are expected to stick to physical distancing if they need to make sandbags. There might also be a lack of evacuation centers. In Western Canada, flooding isn't the worry. As Rafi Bujikanian explains, it's wildfires. When Josh Lambert tackled this monster of a fire last year, it was like nothing he'd seen before. It didn't feel real until we actually, you know, were, were there at the, right in front of it. Residents of high-level Alberta were forced from their homes for two weeks. Lambert stayed behind, part of a major firefighting effort. It felt like you're going and driving through a ghost town. Like it was, it was so odd not seeing somebody. 
The fire is under control now, never completely put out since last spring. Five others currently burn in Alberta, none of them out of control, but that could change and COVID-19 could change the equation further. I don't know what to call it, the perfect storm. High Level would normally use its sports complex to house communities fleeing fires. But Alberta Health Services is now using it as an assessment centre for the coronavirus. The town needs to think about scenarios if its residents have to escape again too. If we do have a uh, fire where people have to evacuate, how do we keep the people separated from people that may have been infected? It's also not unusual for firefighters from elsewhere to fly in and help out here during emergencies and vice versa. Harder when many commercial flights are cancelled. This is uncharted territory for all of us. The Alberta Firefighters Association is trying to make sure firefighters here are ready. Fires don't stop during a pandemic. It's asked the province to speed up testing for hundreds of firefighters in self-isolation. Alberta Health says they are a priority, along with other frontline workers. The province says it will impose fire bans and begin fire surveillance earlier than usual in Alberta's wilderness areas. And it says it's planning further steps to try to contain fires during the pandemic. Rafi Bujikani and CBC News, Edmonton. Next on The National, what's it really like on the front lines of COVID-19? We'll get a first-hand look in our Doctor Diary, next. We've heard the cheers for them on the outside. And we've seen their faces, sometimes bruised and certainly tired, on the inside, ready to celebrate even the smallest of victories. But what happens in between those moments? We wanted to get a look inside a healthcare facility, so we handed things over to Dr. Danielle Martin. In our first doctor diary, she shows us how one hospital in Toronto is preparing and transforming into a pandemic center. Like many people, I'm trying to avoid taking public transit. I will be taking my summer ride to work. I'm Danielle Martin. I'm a family doctor and chief medical executive at Women's College Hospital in Toronto, and I'm the medical lead for our hospital's COVID-19 pandemic response. Normally this hospital is a totally outpatient hospital. We don't have any inpatient beds. We have no emergency department. But like every organization in healthcare right now, we are being stretched to try to think about creative solutions and how we can help with the surge. Okay, so I'm garbed up now in our assessment center, which is where we test patients who may or may not be COVID positive. We've developed a really neat protocol here that is mostly virtual. People fill out an online form and then they speak to a physician by phone and then they come in for a super rapid swab. One, you're great, mask back up. They're only here for two, three minutes just for swabbing and a quick physical exam. And the rest of the assessment is all done at uh, comfort of their homes. Okay, I'm here in our surgical recovery area where we normally only do day surgeries. And this is the amazing team that's in the process of planning to put inpatient beds in a part of the healthcare system where there never have been beds before. Our biggest challenge is gonna to be to change our mindset from looking after patients for a quick, short procedures to go home the same day to actually keeping patients in, looking after them. As someone who cares about our healthcare system a lot, of course I worry about what's gonna happen during the surge to our family and friends and community members as they get hit with this and to our healthcare system but I also lie awake at night worrying about what's gonna be left when the surge is over. So many people are having their surgeries canceled and their appointments canceled right now, not getting access to important healthcare services because we're all just battening down the hatches, working so hard on dealing with what we know may be coming. And that comes at an, a risk and an expense of uh, an impact down the road. And I worry about how we're gonna pick up the pieces of all of that with wait times and people potentially lost to follow up when this is all done. As we know, there have been a lot of changes. So we've been asking Canadians to share what life looks like during this pandemic. Here's tonight's Pandemic Diary. Hi, my name is Ella. I'm seven in grade one. I'm feeling happy and sad at the same time. The happy is I get to play and do 
work. The sad is because I miss my friends. I have a little brother and sometimes we get bored because we're stuck inside. I like doing ballet online, but it's harder to do it. And it's just confusing. I feel worried, like, when is COVID-19 gonna be over? I don't like COVID-19. What gives me hope is that we get to go back to school and COVID-19 will be done. Auto racing is one of the few sports that's carrying on during this pandemic, virtually. Next, how it features a Canadian star who's been off the track since a devastating crash. We're back right after this. The IndyCar season may be suspended and the Indianapolis 500 postponed until August. But the motor racing organization has found a way to give fans the content they crave by going virtual. NASCAR's inaugural iRacing event attracted more than 900,000 viewers, making it the most watched televised esports event ever. IndyCar has held its own successful events too, and as Jamie Strachan explains, it featured a remarkable comeback for a Canadian racer. Isn't this a feel-good story for Robert Wickens? Back in the familiar colours in the Lucas Oil. This is his first form of competition since the Pocono crash. Canadian race car driver Robert Wickens is back on the track. Sort of. He's actually in his Indianapolis home on a sophisticated simulator. For throttle, I'm using this paddle here. He's competing against the best drivers in the world. The same ones he used to race against all part of IndyCar's virtual racing series. It's kind of like a, a surreal experience, you know? For me, this is really step one to, to get back in, into the race car. It was Wiccan's first taste of competition since a horrific crash nearly two years ago that left him partially paralyzed and lucky to be alive. His goal has always been to race again. When CBC caught up with him last November, he was relearning how to walk. It's a grueling rehab process that continues to this day. This is a major step in Robert Wickens getting back to full-time racing. Minus the smell of burning rubber, it's a genuine race experience requiring physical stamina and laser focus. If anyone who's played a racing game at home or in an arcade, or if you've gone to one of those facilities where you can try a real racing simulator, Going an hour without crashing on a simulator is very, very hard. With all sports shut down because of coronavirus, this advanced simulated racing has allowed IndyCar to stay relevant, keeping a fresh product on television. Winning here requires the same abilities that drivers need in a real race car. Using your thumbs to move a soccer ball around is nothing like playing real soccer. It's a different skill set. So that's really what makes auto racing and iRacing unique is that it, it really is the same skill sets. For Robert Wickens, it's a chance to show that despite all he's been through, he can still go fast. It was just, it was very rewarding to cross the finish line. Wickens started this race dead last in 29th position. He finished eighth. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. Next on the National, a post-quarantine reunion and a belated birthday celebration. The sweet moment and the lengths one dad went to to make sure his family stayed safe. Self-isolation has been hard on families. And the man in this photo, Blaine Tucker, had to watch his daughter celebrate her first birthday from that window outside their family home. Tucker was quarantined in a tent on his driveway after returning home to Newfoundland from work in Alberta. Their family reunion is our moment. Come up with daddy. Come up with daddy. When I came in, uh, she looked at me and she turned her head and then she looked again and was like, daddy's inside. And when she actually realized I was there with her, that's when she started to get excited. She started to jump around. But when I picked her up, that's when she realized that daddy was back in the house. And uh, it was very emotional for me. 
Aww. You know, once he was in here and to see Ella Rose's reaction, it was, it was all worth it for sure. Hi, baby. But now we are where we are. I survived and uh, I would do it again if I had to. So he coughed there, but he's not sick, didn't have any symptoms during those 14 days. If you ever had a one-year-old, and I did a long, long time ago, I can't imagine being out there on the driveway in a tent for 14 days knowing your kid's inside. But obviously the payoff, a healthy family, was uh, what motivated him. That is the National for Friday, April the 10th. Good night.